Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Pantsuit Politics. We have a lot to talk about today, but before we dive in, so many of you have gotten your extra credit subscriptions. It's been amazing to watch your unboxings. It's the first unboxing thing I've ever really been into, but I love watching you open your boxes from Wild Geese Bookshop. Tiffany has done a beautiful job and her team of putting those together. So one of the books included in your extra credit subscription is How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell, which we both loved. It's weird and wild. And we talked about it for the Nuance Life bonus episode this month. But here's what we've decided. We're just going to share it with everyone. We're going to put it in our regular feed on tomorrow's episode of The Nuanced Life. This book is highly political. So if you are not a regular Nuanced Life listener, this is a good time for you to check that out. If you love The Nuanced Life and have been thinking about making that leap to Patreon to get our bonus episodes, this is a great example of what we do there. So tomorrow, don't miss it, especially all you extra credit subscribers. The Nuanced Life will be about how to do nothing. We are together Today at Edge Media Studios in Indianapolis, before we talk to the Indianapolis Credit Bureau League, we're also taking video, much to best chagrin. So hopefully we'll be able to share that on YouTube so that you can see what it looks like when we record together. You can see all my um, hand wringing and facial expressions, which I promise will come later in the show when we talk about the Grammys and the fact that Lizzo was robbed. But before we get to that, we're going to catch up on all the news, including the latest impeachment blockbuster revelations and we're going to go back to 2020 share some of your candidate um, endorsements or reasons while you why you are supporting certain candidates we're going to talk about newspaper endorsements we're just going to cover keep covering 2020 as we are mere days away from the Iowa caucus We have been starting a lot of our episodes with some kind of climate change news. And this week in the news, you've seen some reporting about how there's really a growing consensus. We might be moving out of the era of climate change denial. Oh, yeah, I think so. And into uh, skepticism about solutions, perhaps, from people who are not all in, but definitely a growing consensus. And we shared on Instagram that our listener, Jessica. Wait, time out. Can we just take a moment with that? I want to take a moment with that. Yeah, we can take a moment. We don't get enough good news. We, for lots of reasons, don't always have the bandwidth or the time to notice big, good, encouraging, hopeful trends. And this is one of them. I read a in-depth coverage from Davos. Um, House Republicans are putting are moving past climate denial in their publications. The Trump administration at Davos was talking about some of their initiatives to to fight climate change. I think we are going to leave behind the idea that this is not um, a problem, that it's not caused by human behavior. And like Beth said, we're not, that doesn't mean we're all on board with the solution, but I just think we should take a real moment to sit with this incredibly positive development that at least we are not disagreeing about the reality and the challenge that is climate change. It puts us in a much healthier place as we start to vet potential solutions, too. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be one answer to climate change. Yep. It's going to vary by geography. It's going to vary on all sorts of factors. And we can have that conversation, a much more robust one, mm-hmm. if we've left behind the idea that this has all been a fraud perpetrated on the public. So we have expressed before our concerns about how much air tri- travel we engage in. Yeah. And our listener, Jessica, reached out to us to say, I have one potential solution to help ease that for you, which is to purchase carbon credits when you fly. And so we've done that, and we're going to put a link in our show notes for the goodtraveler.org. There are apparently quite a few places that you can buy carbon credits. We purchased ours at the goodtraveler.org. It's something we're going to continue to make a practice here anytime that we have to fly. And we wanted to suggest that to y'all too. Well, I used to do this several years ago when I lived in D.C., and I forgot the company I used, but I would buy offsets. And then, truthfully, I stopped traveling by air. I did. I mean, I didn't fly when I was having babies and moved back to Paducah almost ever, and I just sort of forgot about it. So I'm so grateful that Jessica um, reached out to us and shared that after we talked about um, – is it Jet? Is it just Jet? JetBlue. JetBlue. There, sorry. Take that out, Dylan. Um, after we shared the story about JetBlue offsetting their carbon footprint – The other positive, um, I think, practice we're all thinking about and um, exhibiting is I saw a trend. Sorry, let me start over. Let me start that whole section over, Dylan, because I was messing with my words. My brain's waking up. 
The other really positive climate change trend I read about this morning, it was a poll, I think it was an Axios' daily email about how many people are reporting that they ate less meat than they ever had before in 2019, especially, (laughs) uh, not surprising considering our conversations, white college-educated Democratic women. So I think that that is another really positive thing everybody seems to be acknowledging. I saw Dunkin' Donuts is going to have... plant-based patties for their breakfast sandwiches now, which I think is really great. And so I think that that is another really positive habit everybody is examining um, for themselves as individuals and contributing to the sort of positive forward movement on climate change. We've just been trying to adopt meat as a side item in my house because I don't have everybody on board for full vegetarian. (laughs) Uh, Meat as a side item is a really easy way to start to change this trend in your Mm. diet, I'm finding. So just a suggestion if you also have, um, I don't know, husbands who don't want to go meatless in your domains, just (laughs) cook it on the side. (laughs) Related to climate change certainly is the spread of the coronavirus. Not that it is caused by climate issues, but when you read about global trends, global health and climate change are closely connected. And we are seeing coronavirus potentially becoming a global issue. We've got confirmed cases now in the United States, five of them, confirmed cases in France, Hong Kong, Japan. And what we know now is that at least 80 people have died from coronavirus in China, that every major city in China has a confirmed case. And the CDC has given us some good information about common coronavirus, but this is a novel form, and so we're still learning about it. I think that's the most unnerving thing. Mm -hmm. When you go to the experts and they say, oh, we'll update you as we learn more. Yeah. I was really disturbed to read about how quickly it adapted. It's adapting way faster than the SARS virus did. And of course, the SARS expert in China came out and said this is going to be way worse before it gets any better. It's also really um, upsetting to read some of the reports coming out from these quarantine zones. Is it actually um, helping to stop the spread because people are really suffering inside these quarantine zones if it's not. Um, They're running out of supplies. They're running out of food. Um, That's a huge issue. And, of course, the number that the Chinese are self-reporting just keeps escalating in a way that I find slightly suspicious. I'll be honest. I mean, we were talking about this last week, and it was like, oh, well, we have 300 confirmed cases, and now it's like 2,000-plus. They're basically building pop-up hospitals to try to um, treat the people that have the coronavirus. It's just, it's a really, really concerning situation. And as you think about the spread of infectious disease, the phrase pop-up hospital doesn't sound very comforting Mm -hmm. to me. I'm thinking about this as potentially a new normal. Yeah. I just think it's um, likely that we're going to continue to have viruses that spread on a global scale. And we need to be prepared for that. And we need to find ways to react to it that don't involve panic. Uh, but that also involve a lot of vigilance and paying close attention to our own body. I mean, I think part of what's so disturbing about coronavirus is it has a list of symptoms that pretty much everyone I know has right now. Word. I mean, they're just all associated with the common cold. And so how how do you know when to reach out to your doctor and when not? And I hope that the medical community will really think about that and give us some good indicators of this is when you need to call us um, and don't flood our offices otherwise, because mm-hmm. that doesn't help either. We are also paying close attention to the reports of service members in Iraq diagnosed with traumatic brain injuries as a result of Iran's strike on the basis housing American troops several weeks ago. As of today, there are 34 service members who have been diagnosed, and the DOD did a briefing on this after, side note, President Trump's truly insensitive and dismissive remarks about traumatic brain injuries as if the only troop injuries that matter is if somebody loses a limb. I was truly horrified, horrified by his remarks about this. Yeah, the president referred to these as some headaches. Um, It is worth your time to read the transcript from this Department of Defense briefing. We'll put a link in the show notes, especially as members of the media start to ask questions 
because as much as they talked about transparency in this briefing and trying to give everyone really complete and accurate information, they didn't have a lot of specifics after providing the numbers on troops being transported to Germany for treatment and some being transported home to the United States. When you're taking people out of Iraq to Germany and the United States for treatment, that sounds even more significant to me. They talked about how they're using the term concussion as sort of an umbrella term for several different things that happened. So it bothers me that the president talked about it this way. I also think this is a good moment to reflect on the fact that as a culture, we don't take concussions seriously enough. We don't take traumatic brain injury seriously enough. I've been watching Cheer along with lots of other people and thinking about how we say to these women who cheer and men too, oh, you you have five, you've had five concussions. Well, uh, heal up because we need to throw all 90 pounds all 90 pounds of you in the air again and see what happens. I mean, we are really casual about how many athletes get hurt in this country in this exact same way. And it's especially offensive when we're talking about our service members overseas. And so um, I just think it's a good moment to pause and recognize that that is a problem. Um, That does not mean that Iran was able to strike without hurting America in any way. And I can imagine if I had family overseas, I would be even more upset about this. Well, that's what makes me so mad is I do think we've had positive movement on this issue. And we've seemed to um, begin a conversation about how serious concussions and traumatic brain injuries are. Um, In the military, of course, there's an ongoing conversation surrounding football and CTE. I'm really excited to listen to that daily episode about the town in Texas. Um, That's an a subject I'm so interested in. I always tell people when I got pregnant with Griffin and people would try to taunt me and they would say, well, what are you going to do if he wants to play football? And I said, I'm going to say, no, why would I even consider letting my child play football? And people thought I was crazy at the time. They would blow me off. Oh, you'll see when your kid really wants to play. And by the time I had Felix, um, probably really by the time I had Amos, two years later, and Amos was like a toddler, and people would say that, and I would say, oh, I'm definitely not going to let him play, and they'd go, oh, yeah, me neither. Like, in that short span of time, I noticed the shift in people from sort of rolling their eyes at me saying, no, of course, if your kid wants to play, you'll see, to, oh, yeah, no, I would never let my kid play football. I think it's been a lot of um, fast-paced change, but the problem is... The conversation is limited by our lack of knowledge. And we don't really know what concussions do to the brain. We don't really understand the brain that great at at all. all. Um, So I think that that, you know, is just that's where that's sort of where we're limited in this conversation. But that's what made me so angry to hear him. Not surprisingly that he's still in, you know, 1985 when it was just a headache and nobody took it seriously because he doesn't seem to want to advance in his understanding of the world um but still just so discouraging let's turn our attention to secretary pompeo because katie and several other listeners have reached out asking us to talk about the reported exchange between secretary pompeo and npr's mary louise kelly if you have not been following this story uh secretary pompeo sat down with mary louise kelly for an interview um about Iran and Ukraine and lots of other things. His belief was that Ukraine would not be part of this conversation. She asked about it. After the interview was over, he declined to give any real specifics. She really pressed him on his unwillingness to defend Ambassador Marie Ivanovich in the face of the mounting assault on her from Rudy Giuliani and others. So after the interview was over, Mary Louise Kelly reports that Secretary Pompeo called her back to his private room in the State Department, began to yell at her, cursed at her, asked her if Americans really care about Ukraine, if she could find Ukraine on a blank map. Which Actually had a map, a map brought Why in. did they have these hanging around? <laughs> yeah. Whatever, I have questions. Um, and that the berating lasted about as long as the interview itself. And then she disclosed all of this. His team said this was supposed to be off the record. She said very much not off the record. Um, and he then started tweeting about Proverbs. It's really been an embarrassing episode all the way around. And I think a couple things are really important about it. One, as Katie points out, uh, journalists are in a really tough climate right now. And I think it's important to remember what people go through to bring us information, even if you believe all that information is hopelessly biased. They are enduring a lot to provide it, and I'm grateful for that. 
Secondly, I think it's really significant that Secretary Pompeo feels so free to speak to a journalist this way, attack that journalist in the media as he has, going as far as suggesting that she didn't know where Ukraine was and instead pointed to Bangladesh. And if you look at a map, give me a break. There's no way. I mean, it's just that goes too far. If you're going to accuse her of not getting it right, I know one. it wasn't Bangladesh that she highlighted on the map. That he feels so free to do all of that in the midst of an impeachment trial in which he could very much be a material witness if anyone's interested in getting to the facts. See, I think it's the opposite. I don't think he feels free. I think he feels tightened. Mm -hmm. I think he feels under pressure. And that's why he exploded in that way. Um, So I listen to a lot of NPR. I feel very personally possessive of all the NPR hosts. In particular, Mary Louise Kelly. I mean, you just feel like you, it's the same way people feel about us. I listen to them all the time. And so I was like, how dare you, sir? How dare you speak about Mary Louise Kelly this way? Like, I was so angry. And it's not like what, like, I don't want to bust on CNN. CNN does good work. But it's NPR is not CNN. They don't have time to fill. She has no investment in creating this sort of drama so that she can stretch it out for hours in front of the camera. That's not what they do there. In fact, I was trying to look for some times that NPR has covered this to hear what they were saying, and it was hard to find. Like, I was looking in that podcast feed. I'm like, oh, surely, like, up first over the weekend talked about it. Surely the NPR News summary talked about it. I can listen to how they're covering it. Oh, no, couldn't find it. What does she have to gain in making up this story? Like, come on. What does she have to gain from putting herself out there, attracting the attention of Trump trolls? I am positive she's probably already received death threats, is already being doxxed on Twitter, God knows what. Like, why would she do this? Why would she make this up? Like, it just infuriates me. I just struggled to say anything redeeming about Secretary Pompeo. Mm-hmm. I've been really disappointed in his tenure at the State Department. And if he's talking to a journalist like this, imagine how he treats the people within the State Department mm-hmm. when he's feeling the pressure, when it's a rough day, when someone screws up on something. Uh, he has been a really good soldier for the president, and I know that he hopes to parlay that into future political um, good fortune. I think this is a very character-revealing exercise that we should take note of. Well, and here's the other thing, too. This really bothers me. When the president talks about the media, when um, people, the far right, talk about the media, reporters are um, Americans. They're actually citizens of this country, human beings doing the best they can. And it's like the the way they talk about the media, it's if there's like this cabal and they're all soldiers and they all get together and divvy up the attacks. I mean, it's just the, 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 the ways, the conspiratorial manner in which they speak about the media and they talk about reporters as if their only desire in life is to attack Donald Trump, as if these people aren't in a highly competitive, highly competitive field um, that takes itself very seriously. Now, that's not saying that the media is above reproach. We criticize the media all the time here. There's too much corporate concern. But when you're talking about the individual reporters and talking about them as if they are, you know, like the highest level spy not to be trusted with some ulterior strategy in place. Like it just really bugs me. No, these are just people who are working their butts off, doing the best they can. They don't make every decision correctly, just like everybody else in their job. But it just, I hate the way that when something like this bubbles up, it becomes this really, really dismissive tone the way people talk about individual reporters. Well, they're also not all or even mostly attending elite cocktail parties. I mean, I think we really caricature all reporters through the lens of a very select few in the national press. So important not to do that. Also interesting to his question of, do you think Americans care about Ukraine? Ambassador Bill Taylor is out with an op-ed in the New York Times saying, Yes, Secretary, here is why Americans should care about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it's well worth the read. We'll link that in the show notes as well. And just a note that Ambassador Bill Taylor, who testified in the House impeachment inquiry, is now home 
and we have a new charge d'affaires in Ukraine as of January 1st. Uh, she was there before Bill Taylor, and I don't know when, what the schedule is for actually having a confirmed official there, but uh, Bill Taylor is home now. Also, here's something else, just before I let go of Mike Pompeo for one more minute. The idea that, oh, well, Americans don't care about Ukraine, which is something he, did he say it to her or did he say it afterwards? She says he said it to her, right? I think she says he said it to her. Um, okay, a couple things. One, I don't think that's true. Two, even if they don't, you're the Secretary right. of State. You should most certainly care and you should most take it, most, let me start over, Dylan. And you most certainly should take it upon yourself to educate them about why they should instead of keep blowing it off like it doesn't actually matter. That's a good segue to talking about impeachment because I heard uh, Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, where we are today, on Meet the Press over the weekend. And I found it really interesting that Mike Braun's main argument in talking about his approach to the impeachment trial was basically saying, my constituents don't care about this, and therefore I am not going to care about it. That I am not a trustee here, I am a delegate. And we should basically adopt the American Idol approach to governance. I'm just going to check with people and see how they feel, and then I'm going to do exactly what they want to do. And I think there is an argument for that approach. It's not ridiculous. But to the point about Secretary Pompeo in Ukraine, Americans don't have the capacity to care about everything that America, the country, needs to care about. And that is why we have elected representatives instead of doing everything via direct democracy. And so I really am interested in this strategy from Republicans because it's it's a strategy that makes every part of this exercise meaningless. Doesn't matter what witnesses say, my constituents don't care about it. Doesn't matter what the facts are. Doesn't matter if the president broke the law as the government accountability office says he did. None of it matters because the folks at home like Donald Trump. And that's the beginning and the end of it from the perspective of our elected officials. Okay. I've thought a lot about this. I've thought a lot about trustee versus delegate when I served as a city commissioner and elected official myself. And here's the thing. Mike Braun didn't put his hand on a Bible and swear to uphold the will of the majority of his constituents. That is not his oath of office. His oath of office is to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And so this idea that you can just wash your hands of all your responsibility by pointing to your constituents and saying the majority didn't want it is so offensive to me. And it is particularly offensive coming from a Republican, the party that likes to insert itself in all manner of people's personal lives, particularly when it comes to reproductive rights, by saying, oh, well, we, we need to be the trustees of women. They can't trust themselves. We can't trust them to make decisions. So we need to, oh, I don't know, um, make waiting periods and lecture them over ultrasounds. And so, like, just the hypocrisy of, well, we will most certainly insert, insert ourselves and you need to, we need to be the trustee over people when the majority of Americans have very different views about reproductive rights. So I just, I don't buy it. I don't think that's your oath of office. I think you trot it out when it's convenient and it's upsetting to me. Well, I think it's related to this argument that this should actually be decided by the election, which is another argument that I don't think is a ridiculous argument, but I think it's one that bears some conversation. So if we are saying that what the president did was wrong or inappropriate or a lapse in judgment, but really that should be sorted out at the ballot box, where are the officials saying perhaps he should not be our nominee mm -hmm. or I would not vote for him again because of this contact. I, I will not vote to remove him from office because I think that the will of the people should decide, but I will not be endorsing him. I don't hear any of that. I mean, it's just really difficult to engage with these arguments with the seriousness that perhaps they might deserve in another climate when nothing follows the argument. The mm -hmm. argument just exists out there in the ether and then it's supposed to be dropped and moved on from. So the other major development in impeachment over the weekend, too, we have one, which is a recording made by Igor Fruman at a private meeting with President Trump where you can hear him um, talking openly about the firing of Marie Ivanovich and how it's really linked to the investigation into the Bidens and her holding that up. Also, Mr. John Bolton, man of the hour, the one we keep talking about, Beth Rolder. I see if you're on the video, you can see that. Um, <laughs> Uh, who, first of all, so we, we had leaks of the manuscript of his book, and his book is titled 
the room where it happened. And here's where I roll my eyes. The fact of John Bolton making a Hamilton reference is a little too much for me. A little too much. It's a, it's a bridge too far, personally. But in this linked manuscript, he is reporting that Trump explicitly told him he wanted to continue freezing the $391 million in security assistance to Ukraine until officials there helped with investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens, undercutting the continued Trump uh, defense team assumption, presu- mm, assertion, sorry, Dylan, that this was about corruption and there were all these other reasons and it really just didn't have anything to do with the Bidens. I don't like the way that John Bolton has conducted himself. Maybe that's the end of that sentence. Um, (laughs) Specifically since he left his office. I find it really difficult to assign a whole lot of credibility to him under any circumstances because of his little Twitter teases, because he has been so much more interested in garnering media attention for his post-White House career than anything else. However, when John Bolton says something that has been that corroborates a Mm -hmm. long string of testimony from others and all the documentary evidence that we've seen so far. Um, I'm inclined to take it seriously. And, and I do, I mean, I want to be fair to John Bolton because Sarah and I talked about this when he left the white house, you know, you need someone in the room who's willing to say, Kim Jong-un is not your friend. The room where it happens. Is that the room you're talking about? The one that is an oval on his cover design, (laughs) if you've noticed. (laughs) It is good to have someone with that very hawkish, very skeptical of diplomatic um, pressures kind of position. It shouldn't be the dispositive voice in the room, in my view. But I do think there was value in John Bolton being there. Um, and, and I don't want to just I, I don't mean to say that John Bolton is not credible under any circumstances. I do think the way he has handled himself since he left the White House has been. Uh, Can we talk about that, though? Let's talk about the fact that the Trump administration's approach to Ukraine was so upsetting to the regular diplomatic approach that Mr. Warhawk himself stepped in and said, hey, like, that's not how we do things. I mean, John Bolton's reputation was disruptive. He didn't like that we were, he thought we were overly diplomatic basically everywhere. So what does it tell you that it got so bad in the diplomatic relationships between the United States and Russia and Ukraine that Mr. Warhawk himself was like, well, let's pump the brakes here, guys. I don't know. I think that's ideologically consistent because the hawkish position was give them this defense funding. Mm, that's true. Give them this defense funding to combat Russia and aggression. So I, I think it makes sense that John Bolton would have been that voice in this room. Um, for John Bolton to be so critical of the president's motivation, I think, is the key here. And um, so, so before the story broke, what you heard everywhere is probably not going to get those four Republican votes for witnesses. Mm-hmm. Probably not going to get them. And there's slightly more optimism this morning as we're recording on Monday. I think the ball game is going to be the Republican caucus lunch Mm. that's happening today on Monday. So we'll update on the nightly nuance and on Instagram and Sarah's news brief as we learn more about what happens there. I think the, the situation with witnesses, to state it plainly, is... People don't want witnesses because then the floodgates open. If you have John Bolton, there's no way he sits in the chair under oath and doesn't necessitate testimony from lots of other senior Trump administration officials. And so where does that end? And that's why I think Senator Braun and others are circling around to just none. It just doesn't matter. Mm. We'll just concede all the facts. But we're still not going to do this. And so Ugh. what's the point of any of the ex- exercise? And I think that's really the the only place to be if you're a Republican who doesn't want to vote for a removal here. Mm. Can I say one more thing about this before we move on? Mm-hmm. I have very strong feelings about all these process arguments because I'm a process girl. I love process. And I do think things should be done according to a specific plan. One, and this is a point that I probably make too often, there is not – the kind of process for how an impeachment inquiry and trial gets conducted that is so well established in our country that, that Democrats have deviated yes. from it so sharply that we should just toss the whole thing no, out on process No, they act like it's something grounds. we do every other month. It's so ridiculous. The other thing is when you talk about due process, which they love to talk about, the president hasn't had due process here. Due process applies when someone's life Liberty or property is at stake. Mm -hmm. The presidency of the United States is not Donald Trump's life, his liberty or his property. 
he's not entitled to continue to serve in this office if he has done something so egregious that he ought not. And we as voters are not entitled to have our candidates serve in office if yep. they've done something so egregious that they ought not. And I just think it's important for us to like take a breath and take a step back because it's easy to lean into that. Oh, maybe it has been unfair. Maybe it went too quickly. Maybe they should have fought for subpoenas in court. OK, maybe they should have prudentially. But none of that is the standard on yeah. the line here. Well, and what else bothered me about Donald Trump's reaction to this revelation from John Bolton was the, you know, he went on a little tweet storm. Well, he just wants to sell books. And I thought, you know what? So fascinating to me is there's always a reason from you that someone else is lying. Always, always there's a reason that someone else is lying. But we are never, ever supposed to assume that you're lying. And we're always supposed to trust you and take you at your word, but never anybody else. Isn't that so convenient? Well, it's convenient in the way that people taking grave offense at comments from Chairman Schiff and Chairman Nadler oh my is God. convenient. That pearl clutching, I couldn't. The not. hypocrisy of it is really difficult. And and look, do I desire for the Senate to be a chamber where we never hear things like head on a pike? Yes, I do. I am the ultimate in pearl clutching, and I will own that. <laughs> I wish to always be a pearl clutcher, but at the same time. You have to think about why you're there and whose conduct you're there to assess. Yeah. And all the reporting around this, I'm afraid, is turning this into more of a referendum on how the House impeachment managers are performing yeah, than on so the president's true. conduct. Well, I mean, because the, the burden of proof is on them. Some of that is fair. The burden of proof is on the House managers. But the idea that you're going to get so upset because Adam Schiff is incendiary while we live in Trump's America? I don't think so, friends. Well, let's extend some good thoughts into the universe before we move on to the 2020 primary, which also will have some good thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's an mm -hmm. interesting time. Elections are, are the best of times and worst of times, as I'm fond of saying. But we want to acknowledge two losses over the last week. Um, the loss of legendary political reporter Jim Lehrer. Um, who wrote a book that I cannot recommend enough, especially right now as we're in the midst of an endless sea of debates. It's called Tension City, about the history of debates in the United States and some of the most interesting things that have happened in debates. And also the tragic loss of Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven other people in a helicopter crash. Including two other young girls. You know, I got in a conversation with my husband last night about Kobe Bryant. Um, I, you know, Kobe Bryant was... Definitely, without a doubt, objectively, a legendary basketball player. He had five championships. He scored 81 points in one game. My favorite stat, though, is that he also had the most missed shots because he was just shooting all the time. He had a, he had a reputation for being um, sort of selfish on the court, very aggressive, very competitive. And he has a complicated history. He was accused of sexual assault, settled that civilly out of court, but then also had – Four daughters pursued women's sports, coached women's sports. That's where they were on a travel team. They were going to a travel team for his daughter and the two young women on the um, helicopter. And I told my husband, I said, you know, we don't we do this every time someone famous and someone famously complicated dies, especially because he was so young, only 41 years old. Um, I mean, his youngest daughter wasn't even a, isn't even a year old. And I think, you know, we it's like we all think we need to have a culturally approved amount of grief that everyone must stick to. And it's just outrageous. Like, we don't all have to decide that there is one way to feel about Kobe Bryant and his tragic passing. The people of L.A. are going to feel this much more profoundly than anywhere else in the country. He was with the Lakers his entire career, um, skipped college, went right from high school. And I just think, you know, we don't – if you're a basketball fan, you're going to feel this differently. If you're a, a victim of sexual assault, you're going to feel this differently. And let's just l allow space. You know, the most important thing to remember about famous people is that we're always talking about something besides the famous person. You know, that's why I love Anne Helen Peterson. This is what she's taught me in my life is that, you know, celebrity is always about something else. And we're exercising a lot of cultural stuff when we talk about famous people and especially when we talk about them and they die in tragic ways. And so... I mean, I think the important thing to remember is that Kobe Bryant was a, hu a real life human being with people who loved him. And just like every other human being on planet, there were people he hurt over his lifetime, too. So um, when we experience 
um, a, a death like this that just consumes the national conversation, you know, we don't have to we don't have to reach a preordained conclusion about how we should all feel about it. I think that's especially true when multiple family members are lost at one time. Oh my that's gosh. so cruel to wake up to news that you've lost one family member, but to have lost more than one. Uh, it's awful. And so I think the more kind of gentleness we can leave around this, the better. Next up, we're going to talk about the 2020 race. Working out is hard. Bomba socks can't change that, but they can make it more comfortable. If your resolution is to get fit this year, start by getting socks that can keep up every step of the way. Okay, sometimes I do my yoga with Adrienne in socks because my feet are cold. And we my devotion to Bombas wool socks is well documented at this point. But the other day, I had another pair that shall remain nameless of socks on. And I thought, why am I even keeping this? I tried to do yoga in them. They were bunching. They were sliding. But I can do my yoga with Adrian, which doing yoga in socks is controversial. I understand that. But the Bomba socks, they stay, they grip. I really, they keep my feet warm in the early mornings when I'm waking up to do my yoga with Adrian. I love them so much. They're very important right now, too, because you and I have made the somewhat ridiculous decision to go only to cold places this winter. <laughs> and so having our Bombas with us is really important. Bombas makes a variety of performance socks designed for everything from running, hiking, cycling, basketball, tennis, and more. Sarah would add yoga to that list. Mm -hmm. They're made with a lightweight poly cotton blend. So no matter how hard you're working, your feet will stay cool, dry, and comfortable, never sweaty. Bombas socks provide support in places you didn't even know you needed. Each sock is built with a special arch support system that's supportive, but not not too tight. Bombas are designed with left-right contouring and a Y-stitched heel, so they stay perfectly in place, and they've gotten rid of that annoying toe seam on the top. Mm -hmm. For every pair you buy, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. Go to bombas.com slash pantsuit today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash pantsuit for 20% off. Bombas.com slash pantsuit. Everyone has their own travel style. Some people like to get dressed up for a flight and others choose comfort. My travel style is overpacking, which I do every single time, <laughs> especially now that I've become the official Pantsy Politics carrier of our books wherever <laughs> we go. Away has a range of suitcases made of different materials, a variety of colors, and two carry-on sizes, so there's something for everyone. And Away's features include 360-degree spinner wheels, a laundry bag for dirty clothes, and a built-in lock, all in a lightweight suitcase with a durable exterior, making traveling much easier. Away products are designed to last a lifetime, so if any part of your suitcase breaks, they'll arrange to have it fixed or replaced. There's also a 100-day trial on everything Away makes, and you can return any non-personalized item for a full refund during that period. Away offers free shipping and returns on any order within the contiguous U.S., Europe, Canada, and Australia. The newest line of suitcases are made from a durable, water-resistant nylon exterior that can expand 1.75 inches. I really need those 1.75 inches. And my Away suitcase is doing a great job pulling my books around the airport. There's a good compartment in them for the books. I'm telling you what I love about Away is that I can't lose anything in the suitcase because it's so thoughtfully designed. There are so many places to stash small things that I need. To get your suitcase and shop other travel essentials, visit awaytravel.com slash pantsuit. That's awaytravel.com slash pantsuit. We received a lot of positive feedback on our conversation on Friday about the 2020 primary and especially our effort to highlight sort of the best case that we could think of for Senators Warren and Klobuchar. So we're going to maintain that practice today at your request. We're going to give you our best cases for Vice President Biden and Senator Sanders. But first, we wanted to talk about some more endorsements secured by the women senators running in this race. So the Des Moines Register endorsed Senator Warren. First of all, get yourself over to our Twitter feed and watch the little jig she does when somebody whispers into her ear that she got the endorsement. It's adorable. I really, really was affected by this endorsement because, well, one, I'm just happy she's getting some good news from Iowa. Two, I thought they laid out a really good case for her. They talk about she's not as radical as people think she is. Um, here are the issues that she needs to work on. And what I really loved is their overall case was basically, we understand that people would like a break from Trump. But sort of, let me hold on, Dylan. But their point was, you know, challenging times 
require big leadership. And we don't have time and we don't have space considering all the huge problems facing our country to take a nice little break and settle down after Trump. And I thought, man, that's so true. And what in particular kind of where I followed their logic is we say on this podcast all the time that Donald Trump is not the problem himself, but he is a symptom. And so if he is not the entire problem, then we cannot treat the candidate we nominate as only a solution to the problem of Donald Trump. If we think that he's a symptom of bigger problems, I do, then we need to find a candidate who's prepared to address those bigger problems and not just be the solution to Trump. And I thought the way they sort of argued that, it really affected me because I have been struggling with that. And I have been thinking like, oh, I don't know. Do we need a break? Do we need a moderate? And I thought, you know what? They're right. If, if it's true, which I believe it is, that he's just a symptom of a bigger issue, then we need a candidate who is prepared to really go big on these issues. It's a real contrast to what the New Hampshire Union Leader Editorial Board decided to do in their endorsement of Senator Klobuchar and really uh, frames up and expands on the New York Times struggling to endorse just one person. Because you read the Des Moines Register um, endorsement and you think, well, there's some very persuasive arguments here. And then you read the New Hampshire Union Leader that is basically sober up, everybody. You want to beat this president? Amy Klobuchar is the person who can do it. That's funny. And here's the problem with the rest of the field. And she has this demonstrated record of winning. And if you want to beat him, here is the path. This is the path. And you read it and it's very persuasive. And I just think it gets back to the New York Times making a pretty good call because yeah. that is a decision that voters are going to have to make. Well, I really liked how um, the Des Moines Register went through every candidate and was like, here's what we like. Here's what we're struggling with I, through all of them. I thought that was a really strong way to kind of organize their thoughts. I mean, as not well. all of them, all of them. Right. There are so many people still running for president. But my, I mean, they went out. They did John Delaney. They did ever the, the big names. Let's put it that way. So this race is far from decided. I think anybody who tells you they believe they know who will win the Iowa caucuses is flatly lying to you yes. <laughs> because it's way up in the air. It does look like Bernie Sanders is surging, at least in the polling in Iowa and New Hampshire. Who knows how that will translate, especially through the caucus process, which, as we've talked about before, really involves a chance for people to sort through what their second choice looks like, maybe what their third choice looks like. We also have more debates coming. And Andrew Yang has earned his way back onto the debate Yay. stage. You have to have 225,000 unique donors for the February debate, debate, which will be hosted by the University of New Hampshire. Sure. A thousand unique donors per state in at least 20 states, 20 states and 5 percent in at least four DNC approved polls. So Andrew Yang is there as are Vice President Biden, Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, Senator Klobuchar, Tom Steyer still hanging in there and Mayor Pete. Do you want to do this Andrew Yang thing at the end? Sorry, Dylan, hold on. Do you want to do it after we do the Bernie Biden thing or do it before that? Let's do it before, I think. Speaking of Andrew Yang, we thought we would start sharing some of your candidate endorsements, your reasons why you're sticking with one candidate or the other because they're so good. And so we had Kelly say, yes, someone who is reasonable and thinks about things in a smart way that doesn't demonize anyone but calls on all of us to question the way we're doing business around here, the way we measure success, the way we see people, a guy saying to the others, no, we don't have to change the rules because we're not even playing that game. His lens is just different. I find it refreshing. I don't know that he has a lock on all the answers, but none of them do. I don't even think Yang believes he has a lock. More like he's got ideas and he wants to give it a shot. I'd like him to be the one leading the conversation and asking the questions. So that is why Kelly is for Andrew Yang. And if you want to see Kelly's entire endorsement along with several other people's candidate endorsements, make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter because we're going to include them in full. We also received um, a note about Bernie Sanders from JP, and I'm going to kick off my best case for Senator Sanders using JP's um, writing. So here's what JP says. Bernard Sanders is a very old man who has been saying many of the same <laughs> things for the past half century or so. For example, whatever one thinks about single payer health care, it wasn't a very popular position in Congress in 1991 compared to today. But Bernie talked about it, not to mention it's kind of humorous to see a 30 something Bernie on Vermont public access TV in the late 70s talking about poverty and looking much the same as today. Other candidates talk about unions, but the Sanders campaign is the only one whose employees are uni unionized through the SEIU. 
There has been much talk about the criminal justice system, but as far as I know, only Bernie has used the term prison industrial complex. And I think Sanders arguably had the most explicitly dovish response to the recent assassination of Soleimani. Okay, you all wanted to hear me talk about Senator Sanders because it is far afield from my political leanings. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do it in my own words. I didn't say anything about Senator Klobuchar last week that I didn't mean. And I am going to do the same throughout the rest of this process. So there are arguments that persuade many Sanders supporters that are not at all compelling or even appealing to me, including this consistency argument, which doesn't mean a lot to me. I know it does to a lot of folks. Um, I will start by saying that I agree that Senator Sanders, now that Senator Booker is out of the race is the most progressive voice on criminal justice reform. And that issue is very important to me. I was happy to learn that Senator Sanders agrees with me that you ought not lose your right to vote when you are incarcerated. I think this is one of the most important civil rights issues of our time. And I do think Senator Sanders is a leading voice on this topic. I have been raving about the Netflix movie, American Factory. And as I watched American Factory, it in the way that documentaries often can because of great production and good storytelling really connected me perhaps more than I've ever been connected to the way so many people in this country just feel screwed on a daily basis Mm -hmm. by the way we have not only abandoned our interest seemingly in worker protection although American Factory does highlight that we're still so much better at that than most of the world, Uh, but abandoned that interest and also really sold out our responsibility in caring about American workers. So American Factory, if you've not seen it, documents the purchase of a factory in Dayton, Ohio, by a Chinese business. And the struggle that ensues when several hundred Chinese workers come over to train these American workers, when Chinese leadership tries to hire American executives, and there's just such a mismatch of the cultures. Uh, But you also see it highlighting safety issues, productivity expectations, a very complicated fight over unionization that is ultimately lost. And when I put myself in that place, not that you have to be a factory worker or even someone in sort of um, the working class, as Senator Sanders talks about it, to support him, I do get that here is a person who is speaking my language. Here is a person who's caring about these issues as much as I care about them. Here's a person who seems to have always cared about these issues as much as I've cared about them. And I think that when you frame up an election between Senator Sanders and Donald Trump, who many people feel similarly about. It is good to have a candidate who speaks to those issues. It is good to have a candidate who is engaging new people in the process. My mind is blown every time I dig into Bernie Sanders fundraising and see that most of his money comes from people who work for Amazon and Walmart and Starbucks. Those are folks that we need engaged in the process. We need them showing up to vote. And I think Senator Sanders is the person who motivates them to come do it. I just want to think, say that I think this exercise is mean. There's a reason I was never a practicing attorney. I'm an Enneagram one. And the idea of like making arguments that don't speak to my passionate heart is difficult for me. But whatever, fine. I'll they can it. be truthful even if they don't speak to your passion, though. Right. Like yeah, I am yes. not I'm definitely not going to vote for Bernie Sanders in the primary. I'm for sure not going to do that. Okay, (laughs) but I still mean the things that I just said. Okay, so Joe Biden. The more I think about a Joe Biden presidency, what appeals to me is the idea that he would go out into the world. He has relationships with foreign leaders. There would be stability because of his eight years of um, as the vice president and his many years in the Senate. And I think that's all true. And I think that is an absolute benefit to him being our next president. I think there is a benefit to just giving everybody a break. I think it is highly unlikely he would serve two terms. And so hopefully we would get a little break. He'd offer some stability. Um, There's been discussions that Kamala Harris would be his vice presidential pick. I love the idea of a single term of Joe Biden and then Kamala Harris as a candidate. That's all very appealing. The other thing I think might be the benefit of a Joe Biden presidency is because of his many, many years in the Senate, because of his historical and institutional knowledge, because of his 
deep relationships. I like to think that Joe Biden could serve as a bit of a congressional coach. And although I do think that there is always the case that a president's going to expand executive power to get what they want, I think Joe Biden might offer the best case of, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe because of all his time in the Senate, maybe because of lessons learned as the vice president, he would be better at shepherding, pushing, waking up Congress to fulfill their constitutional duties. Um, I'd like to see that. And I think a, a single, because of the fact that it would most likely be a single term, he would be set up nicely to think through, okay, it's time for Congress to start doing its job again. I'm only going to have four years. Let's see if we can light a fire over there and um, get some legislation through, make some rules changes and some institutional changes to really strengthen Congress. Well, we are excited to continue hearing your best best arguments for your candidates. And you do not have to adopt this exercise of making the argument for someone you don't intend to vote for. Just tell us who you do intend to vote for and why. And we're excited to hear it and continue sharing those. What's on your mind outside of politics? I am so mad about the Grammys. I didn't even wait for you to finish that question. Lizzo was <laughs> robbed. Billie Eilish took all of the top awards. Song, album, best new artist. And I'm outraged. I am straight up outraged. She's fine. But it, 2019 was Lizzo's year. She should have swept those awards. They have enough controversies for the way they nominate. I mean, why was the, I forgot the artist who, ran, who won Best Rap Album. Doesn't really rap. Billie Eilish talks through her whole dang songs, but she's not in the rap category. I'm just, I'm outraged. I'm out. I'm full on outraged. What advice do you have for the people who run the Grammys going into next year based on your outrage today? Um, why don't y'all, oh, I don't know. Put together a committee. Here are my nominations. Lizzo, Beyonce. I'm trying to think about other people who've been fully on robbed at the Grammys. Just put them in a room. Let them set the rules. Because this is not working. It's not working. Y'all get called out for this every single time. And can I just say, like, it was such a contrast. I watched a little bit of the awards. What you saw was Alicia Keys hosting a... Just full display of diversity. You had um, DJ Calif and John Legend doing this beautiful montage and memorial for um, Nipsey Hussle, who passed away. You see all these um, black and brown faces. You see memorials for Kobe Bryant. You see this. And then in every freaking commercial, it's like Google, which, first of all, look up this Google commercial for Black History Month. It was Amazing. I cried. And so you see all the in the commercials are like Black History Month. And then there was another Google commercial for their support of the NAACP. You see all this diversity. And then it comes to the biggest awards. And it's a little white girl. I mean, can y'all not read the room? My issue with Billie Eilish also is that she just seems bored with life. And my nine-year-old really, really likes her. And I don't want her to be bored with life in that way, in that, like, practiced way. Have you seen the – I don't know who's the woman who does these things on YouTube, but she, like, does um, some Lizzo in the style of Billie Eilish. It's hilarious. I'll find one to put in the show notes. But it is just kind of like, oh, I can't believe we have to exist here all together. It's so annoying. (laughs) Well, and she said, I know I have a reputation for not being excited. I'm very honored. I'm very excited. And I will give her credit for that. But – are we rewarding the, I mean, how old is she? 18? She's the youngest winner. Are we rewarding the 18-year-old who took off like a rocket? Or are we rewarding Lizzo, whose narrative about her success is a gift from the angels? Literally like, I, let me show you where I was 10 years ago. You keep at it. Let me talk. Let me tell you where I was when I recorded Truth Hurts, which is also just a better song on every objective level. I'm just, I'm so upset about it. I can't she even get over it. She brought her flute too. I, I mean, mean, come on. I cannot with you people. She's on the cover of every stinking magazine at the top of every stinking list. And you give all the top awards to Billie Eilish. I cannot. Well, we hope that you are not Grammys outraged as you approach the rest of your week. Well, what are you thinking about? Not much, honestly. It's just been travel and my daughter's birthday was over the weekend, which was wonderful. Um, But also it was right. It was sandwiched between two trips for us. So I came home. I took seven uh, kids between the ages of four and nine to a hotel for swimming and a slumber party. 
Um, what's really funny is that my daughter believes I slept during her slumber party. <laughs> I was in the same room with her and her friends. They were a delight. I mean, they really were fun and precious. I got really sad for a minute because in the pool, they all made a big circle holding hands, doing ring around the rosy and like dun- dunking themselves under the water. And I was thinking about how probably next year our ring around the rosy days are going to be over mm. with that group of girls. They're just maturing and growing so fast, but they're awesome. And it was fun to be with them. I tried to mostly leave them alone. Jane told me that I was a very appropriate mom during this <laughs> gathering, which I appreciate. Um, but it, but it hasn't left a lot of space other than just kind of power through every day right now. You know, I think that the hotel slumber party might present an environment that addresses most of my concerns about slumber parties because you're in such tight corners. There's no way for people to disappear and not be um, monitored in the way that I find appropriate because I'm really about done with slumber parties. I'm ready to just abandon them. I, I don't think I've said this on the podcast before. I maybe have. My mother-in-law had a rule that there were no po- there were no more slumber parties after the age of 13, which I find to be real, real smart. But I'm about to just like drop it down to 10 and just move on and be like, no, we're done. Like we're just done. You know, inevitably they come back tired then they get sick they saw something that i would not have let them see like all this kind of stuff so i'm ready to just drop the whole thing i think it's a wonderful rite of passage to do some slumber parties in your life i watched them resolve some very low-grade conflict over are we going to watch the jungle book or some disney show Um, i also think the hotel slumber party really does necessitate an adult's presence in a way that keeps everything on track. And it's a great opportunity to talk about respect and how we treat people because we had to have lots of discussions about we're too loud right now. There are other people here. Okay, we ate our food out in this common area and now we need to clean it up because we want to be really good guests. Okay, we're at the pool. Other people are coming. So how do we behave ourselves? Um, We're leaving now. We've cleaned up. We're going to leave a nice tip for the people who have to clean this room because there's more trash in here and other things than there usually would be. And so I feel like... I just feel like overall, it's a very good way to do a birthday party, especially yeah, it because it's not at my house. Yeah, the free-for-all mentality. It does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. And too. when your birthday is in January, a swimming pool is like the biggest present that you could get. Well, I thought this was a brilliant idea, and I tried to do it for Amos uh, last June, and we showed up to the hotel, and they were trying to make me sign a thing that said, this is not a summer party, and this is not a birthday party, and if it is, we're going to kick you out basically and I was like oh my gosh it is I guess I need to cancel my reservation you got to call ahead and then Chad always goes and visits ahead of time too just to say here's the plan is all of this okay are the people who working here who are working here this weekend cool with this yeah how can we make them cooler with it we definitely take ice cream to the front desk person you know you just kind of have to like wrap the whole thing up in we're all on the same page here nice nice We hope you all had a wonderful weekend, that you're going into your week just ready for all of the news that we know is coming our way. We'll be back with you here on Friday. You can follow along with our travels on Instagram. We're about to go to Iowa, everybody. So get excited for that. And on Friday, we're going to do a primer on the Iowa caucus in the New Hampshire primary so we can get you um, all, you know, educated and ready for our trips to Iowa and New Hampshire. So everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you for giving us your time and attention. And until we're back with you on Friday, keep it nuanced, y'all. Okay. Thank you.